Hi everybody, markets don't have to operate in isolation, they can be interrelated. In this video we're going to look at complements and substitutes. These are goods that have interrelated markets here. We're going to start by looking at complements. Another name for goods that are complements are goods that are in joint demand, i.e. they are goods that are usually bought together. Some classic examples, printers and the printer ink, coffee machines and the capsules that go in them, razors and the blades. These are all good examples of complementary goods. Let's understand how the markets are interrelated and how we would show changes in markets uh, between the two goods. So let's look at here, first of all, the demand for printers, so the market for printers here, and then the demand for printer ink. So if the price of printers, let's say, goes up from P1 to P2, what, we, what are we going to show there? We're going to show a contraction of the demand for printers. So there is our contraction contraction of demand when it comes to printers. So the price of printers goes up, it's going to shift the demand for printer ink to the left. So less uh, consumers are going to be willing and able to buy printer ink, which is going to shift demand to the left at the same price, causing demand to reduce from Q1 to Q2. So the price of printers has changed, which is why we move along the demand curve there, but that will shift the demand for a complement, in this case printer ink, to the left. Vice versa if the price of a complement goes down. So let's change the example. Uh, we look at the price of razors here, so the market for razors, the demand for razors, and then we look at the demand for razor blades on the right hand side here. So let's now say that the price of razors has decreased from P1 to P2 here. That will lead to an extension of demand for razors. So let's label that extension extension of demand here. Okay, so the price of raises has decreased, which is why we move along the demand curve and show an extension of demand there. But that will shift the demand for razor blades to the right, as more people will now purchase razor blades as they purchase razors. So at the same price, there is now going to be a shift of demand to the right and the increase in demand of razor blades. So this is the interrelationship between markets when there are complementary goods, goods that are in joint demand. And this is how we will show the impact on a diagram here. Uh, what about for substitute goods, goods that are in competitive demand? What would that look like? Goods that are in competitive demand are known as substitute goods. They're rival goods for each other, uh, they're very similar to each other, and they're in competition with each other. Some classic examples are here, Coke and Pepsi, Big Mac and the Whopper, Apple iPhone and the Samsung Galaxy, all classic examples of substitutes, lows out there in the real world. Uh, what we want to show is how the markets are interrelated again, how the price of one good affects demand for another substitute here. So just to speed things up, I've already shown the price changes. I'm going to stick to Coke and Pepsi. It's a very simple, classic example where the price of Coke is changing in both cases. What happens to the demand for Pepsi, the demand for a substitute? Well, if the price of Coke goes up, demand for a substitute will shift to the right. So here we show the price of Coke going up and we see a contraction of demand. We move along the demand curve when it comes to Coca-Cola here and we see decrease in quantity demand in there. But when the price of Coke goes up, demand for a substitute, i.e. Pepsi, will shift to the right. More consumers will be willing and able to buy Pepsi and we see at the same price there is a greater demand for Pepsi. Demand shifts to the right. Whereas when the price of Coke decreases, we see an extension of demand for Coke. We move down the demand curve and we see an increase in the quantity demanded of Coke. Uh, if basically if Coke is cheaper, demand for a substitute, i.e. Pepsi, will shift to the left from D1 to D2 at the same price, which reduces the demand for Pepsi from Q1 to Q2. So the basic idea is as the price of a substitute changes, we move along the demand curve for that good, but then demand for another substitute will shift either to the right if the price of a substitute goes up, or to the left if the price of a substitute goes down. That's how we show it very simply on diagrams. Easy, easy stuff. Let's continue now by looking at derived demand. Derived demand is just when the demand for a good or service comes from the demand for something else. I.e. it's derived from the demand for something else. You can think of this as input demand. When demand for something increases, demand for the input will increase too. Right? So inputs are a derived demand coming from the demand for something else. So great examples are these. On the right hand side is always derived demand. So aluminium is a, de is a demand derived from the demand for cars. Labour is a demand derived from the demand for goods and services. Airline travel is a demand derived from the demand for holidays abroad or for the demand for business work in some way. 
So if we look at a diagram, how do we show it? Very simply here, we've got the, the car market on the left. Let's say there is an increase in the demand for cars for some reason. There is therefore going to be uh, an increase in the demand for the input. So aluminium. The demand for aluminium is derived from the demand for cars. So whenever you have a derived demand here, when the demand for whatever the good or service that needs the input goes up, demand for the input will go up because it's a derived demand. So therefore the demand for aluminium will shift to the right and that's going to be the final result here. Okay, so wherever we have a derived demand, when the demand for whatever the good or service that needs the input goes up, demand for the input will increase because it's a derived demand. Just like when there is economic growth in the economy, demand for labor will increase, reducing unemployment. When there is an increase in the demand for foreign holidays, there'll be an increase in the demand for airline travel, which is necessary to supply those foreign holidays. Okay, so that's the idea of derived demand. Think of it as input demand. Let's continue now by looking at composite demand. Composite demand is the idea that two goods require the same input to make them. And therefore, if there is an increase in the production of one good, there'll be a decrease in the supply of the other because there is less of the input available to make the other good. So good examples, bread and livestock, which require the same input, which is wheat, cheese and butter, which requires the same input, i.e. milk. Let's look at the market for cheese and then the market for butter. Let's say there is an increase in the demand for cheese. So there is an increase in the demand for cheese, there'll be an increase in the price of cheese eventually, but crucially an increase in the quantity of cheese. So there'll be more production of cheese taking place, which means there'll be more use of milk here, which might reduce the supply available of butter because a lot of milk is being used to make cheese and therefore there's not enough milk available to make butter, reducing the supply of butter. That's the idea of composite demand. Okay, and therefore there'll be a reduction in the supply of butter causing this change in the market for butter. So that's the idea. Because two goods use the same input, when there is an increase in the production of one good, it means there is less input available uh, when it comes to making the second good, reducing the supply of a second good here. So a good example for you there. That's it. Let's move on and look at joint supply. Joint supply is the idea that the increase in the production of one good will increase the supply of another good. Why? Because maybe that second good is a byproduct of the first one being produced. So therefore, naturally, supply of it will increase if that first good is produced. Or maybe because that second good needs the first good in order for it to be produced. Best way to understand that is with an example. Let's take honey and beeswax. When the production of honey goes up, the supply of beeswax will naturally increase because beeswax is a byproduct when honey is produced. Beeswax is very useful in producing candles and lipsticks. So naturally, when the production of honey goes up, the supply of beeswax, a byproduct, will increase. Whereas petroleum and paraffin, to produce those, to supply those, requires crude oil. So therefore, when the production of crude oil goes up, the supply of petroleum and paraffin will naturally increase because they require crude oil to produce them. So if we want to show the idea of joint supply on a diagram, how will we do it? Well, let's look at honey and beeswax. Uh, these two goods are in joint supply. So when the production of honey goes up, the supply of beeswax will shift to the right. That's all you need to know. So how do we show an increase in the production of honey? Well, maybe it comes from an increase in the demand for honey. When demand for honey increases, you can see here that there is an increase in production there. That's the most important thing. So when there is more production of honey taking place, there is going to be an increase in the supply of beeswax from S1 to S2. And that's because beeswax is a byproduct. Simple as that. That's how you show joint supply. We could have also done it for crude oil and petroleum. So if there was an increase in the production of crude oil, shown however here, maybe an increase in supply, maybe an increase in demand, showing an increase in the production of crude oil. There'll be an increase in the supply of petroleum and paraffin, which requires crude oil to produce them. Simple as that. Goods in joint supply, easy, easy, easy. You show a shift of supply of the second good, which requires the production of the first good to increase in the first place. That finishes this whole topic area of the interrelationship between markets. Make sure you take all this down. Learn everything, really, really simple stuff, and I'll see you all in the next video.